Welcome, Ajahn. Yes, hello. Stay. Stay, Ajahn. Ajahn, are you at the Hermitage? Yes, I, I usually sit outside, but I've got a, uh, a moth, if, a kind of a rain after rain moth infection infestation, so I had to come inside into my kuti. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. How is this, uh, these times for you, Ajahn? Um, nothing special, yeah, normal. Um, it's not too bad here in Thailand, really. Nothing like in India. How is it in Delhi? Ajahn, more and more people are infested. Uh, it is in yeah. our families, in our societies, in our building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, of our relatives are infested, so. Yeah. So, um, Ajahn, thank you very much for being with us today. And, You're welcome. Uh, so, um, Ajahn, many friends have joined from different parts of the world. And if we could please uh, pay our respects to you first. So friends, let's bow to Ajahn Jai Saro with hands in Anjali. Bow. Bow. Ajahn, may we offer a short introduction uh, about the speaker so that uh, everyone, you know, there may be some new people who are meeting you for the first time. Okay, very short, it's good. <laughs> sure. So Venerable Ajahn Jaisaro was born in England in 1958 and he joined Ajahn Sumedho's community as an Anagarika when he was 20 and took full ordination with Ajahn Chah in 1980. Uh, he is a key figure in the movement to integrate Buddhist developmental principles into Thai education system and is the chief spiritual advisor of the Panyaprati Foundation, a non-profit organization in Thailand. In 2011, Ajahn Jaisaru was granted an honorary doctorate in Buddhist pedagogy by Mahachulilong Korn Raj Vidyalaya University. Uh, so just to continue that story, in 2019 and 2020, Ajahn received monastic titles from His Majesty the King Ram Ten, and Ajahn has written several books on Dhamma teachings. On one hand is his book, Stillness Flowing, a thoroughly researched biography of Venerable Ajahn Chah, running into more than 800 pages and took over two decades in the making. It is a source of inspiration and information for anyone who's walking on the path. And on the other hand, his handwritten notes, known among the practitioners as yellow pages, offer one page nuggets of Dhamma teachings on a weekly basis. These are strewn with contemporary examples, real life stories and words that touch the reader. So with that, we request Ajahn to kindly help us with the answers to our questions. So Ajahn, the first question is that how to find meaning and sense of goodness in relationships, daily life or work? Is doing service a solution? I feel when there is intention of service in life, whether in serving parents, siblings or serving customers, it's good. Kindly advice. Um, well, I think any any activity is is only experienced as as meaningful when it's embedded. Within, can you hear me? Uh, within a value system. So uh, as Buddhists, uh, we have a, a very clear, um, clearly established value system um, based on the idea of uh, liberation through right effort. And so any action which is motiva motivated by a mind free of the defilements of greed and hatred and delusion, and one which is um, increasing the kusala dhammas in the heart is essentially meaningful. Um, so the, um, the effort to help others is an essential part of that, of course, um, but it has to be um, carried on with um, the effort to help oneself 
um, sometimes if we um, dedicate ourselves to service of others without taking care of our own heart, then we can easily get burnt out or frustrated and the results are not as, as good as they might be. But certainly um, dana, sharing, giving, helping others brings an immediate joy to the mind. And what's more, the joy and happiness that arises um, from helping others um, remains as a memory and the recollection of past good and kind actions um, can be a source of uh, refuge and it can be a form of meditation that can calm the mind when other meditation objects um, are not accessible to us, maybe through illness um, or through some other um, event. So yes, uh, uh, of course, um, giving and sharing and working away on that self-concern and self-obsession and just letting go of the burden of self, even temporarily or somewhat superficially, um, is a meaningful activity. Um, but the, the meaning that it gives and the importance is, um, is increased when it's um, in, within the context of right view and the Eightfold Path. Thank you, Ajahn. The next question is, um, how to deal with hypersensitivity? I am not able to see pain without letting it affect me. It can be news or events happening around me. Violence or pain or death affect me. Even in fiction like movies and with unknown people. So much so that I feel nausea and physical discomfort and tears and sorrow despite knowing intellectually that this is Dukkha and it has to be seen and I grasp it. Please help. There is a, a sutta in the Diga Nikaya where Saka, the king of the gods, um, asks a number of very important questions of the Buddha. And they are all based upon this idea of how do we know what's the right amount in, in, in various areas of our life? What's, the, what's our standard? What's our criteria? And the Buddha gave this very simple criteria that um, if, if it's in friendship or relationships with other people or relationships with um, these days with technology and uh, social media, Ajahn, um, looks like you got muted by mistake. Could you please unmute yourself? Okay. Yes, sorry, okay. that's technology. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, we, we need to be observing our minds and particularly observing the kusala or ankusala, the wholesome or unwholesome um, cast or, or, or mood of the mind. And the Buddha says that any activity in which overall, um, this is not a short term thing, but overall, wholesome dhammas increase and unwholesome dhammas decrease, then that's appropriate. But whatever it might be, and whatever other people's experiences might be, for you, if you find that unwholesome dhammas increase and wholesome dhammas decrease, then that's something to avoid or to draw back from. So in terms of um, consumption, I mean, the news, um, we, we're, we are consumers of information these days. Um, the news is like a consumer um, item. And so uh, we need to wisely consider um, how much of in this information we should consume so that unwholesome dhammas don't increase and wholesome dhammas don't decrease. Ideally, um, if wholesome dhammas increase. So if there's an increase in anxiety and depression and 
and sorrow and, and so on, then um, need to pull back and to uh, reduce, restrict your, um, uh, your, your relationship to those things. I mean, um, it, you don't really have to see so much news. I mean, I, I often reminded when I was the abbot of the monastery, I felt it was the first time I really felt that I, I need to have some idea of what's going on in the world when people come to speak with me. Um, and so I, I would get, I, someone would bring me the Sunday Bangkok Post and on the inside of the front page, there would be um, a summary of all the news of the past week. And I would read that and then people would say, oh, Ajahn, how is it you know all about the world? You live in this monastery and you're, how is it possible? Um, and I just read like one, one page summary of the news. So, I, I mean, it may be that the world is getting more complex now and there's more going on, but I don't think that you really need to um, be engaging uh, with disturbing stuff so much. You just need enough to have a good sense of what's going on. Uh, I think it's an interesting phenomena that many meditators, long-term meditators, find they become more sensitive uh, to goodness. Um, so in certain areas of life, you become much more imperturbable and things that normally or formally would have upset you, you find they, they don't upset you anymore. You feel like a, a mountain or a solid uh, rock, but in other areas become more sensitive and be moved to tears by goodness and kindness in a way that you weren't before. So the emotional development, which uh, is not often spoken of in, in traditional um, texts, um, but I think most meditators will, will, will say that uh, our, it's not that we become, uh, become emotion free or emotionless, but there is a, an evolution of, of emotion and we become more sensitive to, to goodness and, and also on the other side to, to cruelty. Um, but I notice it particular because as a monk, you, you see a lot more goodness and cruelty that, that uh, I, I'm, I'm personally, I'm much more sensitive now than I used to be. Uh, Ajahn, just as a follow-up question, if someone is not consuming a lot of news, but is just generally very sensitive uh, because, you know, sometimes we do find that kind of people also. How can they stay stabilized uh, you know, in their environment, even in their immediate environment? Well, meditation practice um, is the, the best um, the simple answer because you are um, developing the ability to, to sustain uh, mindfulness awareness in the present moment and to recognize um, sense consciousness, thoughts, feelings, emotions, memories as phenomena that arise and pass away. And you're training the mind as a desensitization that arises because you're not getting caught up in the content of experience. You're, you're moving more to the process nature of experience. And through um, keeping at that very patiently over a long period of time, then your mind doesn't jump immediately onto the, um, the uh, anxiety inducing or fear inducing um, uh, nature of phenomena because you're seeing phenomena as uh, processes, things that arise and pass away more than you are caught up or that you are drawn into the, the drama of the, of the thought or the memory or whatever it might be. So a lot of you know, the thought and anxiety, anxiety and fear, that, that is something in which there is an element of volition. There, there is a consent to that. Um, and that's very important to, to observe that, that um, those complex emotions that are that are composed of thinking and, and unwholesome or, or toxic kinds of trains of thought um, contain within them a kernel of volition and consent. 
And if you can't recognize that and abandon that, then it's very difficult to, to let go of that habit. Thank you, Ajahn. If we were to take it a step ahead, specifically in today's times, you know, in the pandemic, and especially when it's come so close to us, it's just about everywhere, you know, wherever we look. Um, how does one stabilize? Do we carry the same suggestion that you just offered that, you know, volition uh, is voluntary? Is there something more we can do in such a circumstance? Sorry, I missed the first part of that. Could you repeat the question? Uh, yes, Ajahn, I meant to say that in times of the pandemic, when, uh, mm -hmm. you know, when the Devdutas are so more evident than they ever used to be, uh, while uh, in normal circumstance, uh, you know, volition as a choice of investing into, you know, negative thought process could be still, is to be relatively, you know, one can exercise it possibly more easily. And here there is pretty much every day we hear some of some of the other very disheartening news from our closed ones. So any guidance around that, Ajahn? Yeah, I, I mean, I wasn't trying to make people feel, feel guilty, you know, and say, oh, I'm a bad person because I'm, you know, it's my fault. I'm, I'm just saying that um, that is a, a factor involved. And of course, um, at the present, time with the pandemic and, and particularly in countries like India, um, it's quite understandable um, the, the impact, the toll that has on, on, on mental health and how much of a effort uh, is needed just to keep the mind on a reasonably even uh, keel. But the um, really as, as Buddhists, if we come down to the, like the bottom line is it's no different. Um, we live in a, a very unstable, dangerous um, world. Um, that's the nature of human existence. It's like this. And as, as monks, uh, we, we talk about this and we try to remind people of how um, un unsafe, unsatisfactory, fragile, um, unreliable um, our world, our life is, um, that, that often falls on deaf ears. But it's as if like the mask has been torn away right now. And it's not something new. It's, it's just a, um, a much clearer realization um, of what it is to be a human being in the world. But as uh, I think as Buddhists, practitioners, then we try at least to uh, look on everything as a challenge. The question is, because the Buddha makes it very clear in the Four Noble Truths, doesn't he, that the, the cause of mental suffering is craving. And craving is the, the, the desire that arises um, in the presence of ignorance. Um, so everything else are triggers. There are conditions that are conducive to suffering or, in, or uh, incline us towards suffering or, or um, encourage us to suffer, if you like. But um, the, the hope that we have or the, um, the, the comfort that we can take is that if all those conditions are present, if the mind is free of craving, then suffering can't arise. That's the, it's the key factor. So um, if we can <coughs> reduce all the, uh, as many of the triggers and the conditions for suffering um, as we can, and that's, that's very wise to do that. But um, finally, it's up to us whether we can take care of our minds in such a way that the craving doesn't arise. Excuse me. <clears throat> <clears throat> and I think that, it, you know, when it's living in the present moment is, uh, you know, it's a cliche um, uh, in some ways, but if we just um, keep coming back to our present experience, 
right now, at this very moment? Um, how is it? I mean, it's, it's, it's workable, it's doable right now, this, this second in time, it's doable. What about this second in time? Yeah, it's doable, and this second in time. So um, the, you know, the challenges and the difficulties and the, these, are, um, these are also phenomena that are arising and passing away. So I'm not saying anything really new here. It's just coming back to these very uh, fundamental foundation teachings of just coming back to how it is right now. And when your mind is uh, getting caught up in these trains of thought full of anxieties and worries about loved ones or about one's own career or one's own, et cetera, et cetera, then, then simply turn the light of awareness on that. Don't try and try and force yourself to stop, but just be, yeah, this is, this is anxiety. It's like this. <clears throat> How does it feel? Where, <clears throat> where does anxiety reside? Excuse me, an insect just flew into my mouth. <laughs> I think it's dead. <laughs> um, yeah, so so this is anxiety, you know, and you get to know it. This is um, <clears throat> this is just part of our life, um, and just recognizing something for what it is is usually enough for it to fade out. <clears throat> so. Um, let's keep coming back to right now. It's like this. <coughs> okay. Thank you. That's very helpful, Ajahn. Uh, Sorry. So that's that's really helpful because it does give us a, a a way to operate within, you know, if, if tomorrow it strikes me, if the virus strikes me, then I possibly you know, would be more equipped, hopefully, with, with the guidance you offer. Thank you for that. Yeah, I'm just coming back to this basic recollection. The past is a memory and the future is a thought. Um, so that, that's, that's one of the most radical and uh, useful reflections of all. John, the next question is, there's a request if you could expound on Khanti. Khanti is, um, well, in the, um, in the Awada, in the discourse that the Buddha gave to the uh, great assembly of Arahants on the full moon night of Maga in the first year after his enlightenment and the Buddha gave a kind of uh, a short summary um, of the teachings um, so that all the arahants who were going off in different directions could take it with them as a kind of a handbook as it were or equivalent of a handbook and so the Buddha establishes what is the goal of the sasana and its nibbana and then he says well, what is the the, the most important or the fundamental um, uh, virtue that is needed on the path. And we might think, well, samadhi, sati or samadhi or wisdom, but the Buddha chooses kanti, um, patient endurance or enduring patience um, or forbearance. Um, <clears throat> so this was, you know, an absolutely seminal text, a key uh, teaching that the Buddha wanted to impress on all the Arahants who were going to be the first ambassadors of the, of the religion and something for them to come back to again and again in their teaching to their disciples. So that gives some, some idea of how important it is. But I've, you know, I've noticed and I, I'm no, I've been guilty of this myself that of um, looking at it as a sort of uh, second-class virtue. <coughs> so it's like a consolation prize. You know, if you're a monk and you say, well, how did that go? And I, wow, it, was, eh, it wasn't well, quite what I thought it was and so on. But anyway, you know, I developed a lot of patience. It's like the sort of consolation prize you did when you don't get what you really want. 
And, um, but that's uh, clearly wrong view. And I think it is, uh, again, I mean, uh, it's a real shift if you, in your, the way that you look at your life, if you have that faith that uh, mind, um, forbearance or kanti is a essential pillar of the, uh, of the, um, of the, of the teachings, that whenever in your life you have to exercise patience um, in any area, then you've made a profit that day. You've, you've, you've grown on the path and to see it as actually a, a positive experience, you know, not something, well, it's like bitter medicine, you know, well, yeah, it's probably good for me, you know, I'm a bit more patient, but really to, um, to, to take some joy in that and to uh, looking to extend your ability to be patient. So it doesn't mean like being very ascetic necessarily or doing all kinds of really uh, tough kind of macho things, but just dealing with inconvenience. Uh, there's so many inconveniences in, I mean, in, uh, India is, you know, the most inconvenient uh, place in the world, probably. I mean, it's, it's not convenient, at least when, I, when I've been in India. And it's just a wonderful, I mean, India is the best place in the world, I think, to develop patience. Um, when I was in India in the, in, the, in the 70s, you'd go to change a traveler's check in a bank, and it would take all morning. That would be your, your, your task for the morning, to change the traveler's check. You know, this long queue uh, to one counter, and then they give you a write your name and then you go to another counter and you get a token and then you go to another counter and you know and and so you, for me and i think for many um people you know from my background you just you could not be paid uh, you had to be patient and uh i i think I, I benefited an awful lot of from that throughout throughout my life and of course the training in forest monasteries particularly Ajahn Chah's monastery is um, is very much uh, focused on uh, creating the conditions in which you, you are expected or, or you have no choice um, but to be patient. And um, Ajahn Sumedho's uh, formulation or explanation of, of Kanti is, is I think um, probably the best I've heard is to be um, at peace, to, be, to peacefully coexist with the unpleasant. So it's not a matter of just grinding your teeth and looking at the clock and <coughs> hanging out. <coughs> and, um, you know, um, looking at patience as something you could be measured by time, but it's a, a sense of willingness to bear with. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> There's a lot of insects around here. Yeah. Just excuse me. <coughs> yes, okay. Um, yes, to be not to react against the unpleasant, to say, yeah, we can, we can do it together. We can, I can be with this. I can be with this without reacting against it, without being, feeling oppressed by it, without feeling it's a burden, without being depressed by it, uh, be out, without feeling weighed down by it. <clears throat> um, and so it, the, the patience is the sense, there's a sense of um, calm and peace within that. Um, <clears throat> so that may well um, alternate with periods where it is just a matter of gritting your teeth, um, but that's not the, the real kanti the, uh, that the Buddha is, is talking about, I think. And, um, So yeah, and when you the thing is when you give things um, a precedence, you get you have a name, you have a word there, and you have a 
uh, you make it a, um, a spiritual goal, then it comes to mind. You recollect it more easily. And in, in uh, say, when it's very hot or very cold, uh, you're hungry, you're thirsty, and so on, then it comes to your mind, you know, this is the time uh, to develop patience. Uh, when you are um, faced with people mistreating you or um, misrepresenting you and so on, and it's not yet, it's not possible to do anything about it, maybe there will be some, some time in which you can <clears throat> Uh, speak with the person involved or, or make some effort to, to um, redress the, um, the unfair situation, whatever it might be. But in the meantime, yeah, this is a time to, to develop patience. And um, it, it gives the mind an incredible strength. And um, so, it, you know, there's so many so many things in life that people have the capacity, have the potential to realize in their life. And if you look at it, when you get down to it, the, realize, the, re the reason that they don't is simply a fear of suffering, a fear of pain, a fear of discomfort, a fear of embarrassment. And so that, that fear of, 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 of pain, just makes our life so much more narrow and constricted and poor um, than they need to be. And this is something that um, you notice if you develop patience, that there is a twinge, obviously twinges of fear and don't wanna make a fool of yourself or afraid it's gonna be tiring or it's gonna be exhausting or it's gonna be painful, but that's not the overriding, that's not the main thing. It's just kind of one thing in your mind. It's not the main thing anymore. And you say, yeah, I can, I can handle that. I've, I've handled worse. I won't enjoy it, but it won't be the end of the world. That's, um, so I think that um, there's so much to gain from, from patience. Mm -hmm. Imagine how to develop this in children, in toddlers specifically? Toddlers and teenagers. How to develop patience in toddlers and teenagers? How can it, can we help them do that? Well, again, it's it's a matter with um, you know the Buddha says that parents uh, reveal the world to their children. They show the world. So it doesn't mean like they they open an atlas and show them the countries of the world. Uh, here, the world means the world of meaning. What's good? What's bad? What's um, interesting, what's not interesting, and, and so on. And, and so as a parent, you want to be showing a world to the children in which being patient uh, is a desirable goal. And so the parents have to model that, um, but also praising children when they're patient. And um, <clears throat> And, and I, I know parents who, who brought children up to, um, you know, just having little rules and making them little games about when they want something. Well, yes, you can have it, but you can't have it until tomorrow or something. You know, just making um, small, small games just to give it to implant, to instill in a small child's mind that, that there, there is not necessarily an immediate need to gratify uh, your desires. And also if you can, if a child really wants something very much um, and the parent says, okay, you can have it, you can have it tomorrow, um, for instance, then when tomorrow comes and the parent says, do you still want it? And maybe the child says, don't want it anymore. Or then, <clears throat> well, then how do you feel about it now? Do you feel as excited as you did yesterday? And so you can be teaching the Dhamma to, to children, just a very simple observation of how your feelings about things change um, and how, um, and, and how when, when you see people being patient and you point that out to your children and you say, look at that person, how, how patient they are. Look, there's somebody who's 
speaking to them very rudely um, and they're still um, being very calm and they're not losing their temper. That's not an easy thing to do. It's, doesn't it look wonderful? Doesn't it look terrible when somebody loses their temper so easily? Um, so this is the way that parents and teachers uh, model um, a world in which patience is um, an important feature and uh, one in which they uh, praise the child and they praise um, patients wherever they see it. And so if, you, if you're talking about patients and you're pointing it out and you're praising it, then children become sensitized to it. Um, I, I was te talking to teachers in the primary school um, where, in which I'm involved in Bangkok. And uh, I, I said, I think that um, maybe we, we emphasize the kind of soft virtues um, like kindness and compassion and so on um, a bit too much, it's lost the balance and we, we need those kind of more vigorous virtues. Um, so, um, so we, 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 we started to, teachers started to, to um, speak to the children a lot and, and um, encouraging them to um, not to give up. So this is the, the kind of teaching is we're Buddhists, we don't give up and making that part of their identity as, as Buddhists from the age of two or three years old. Yeah, this is tough, isn't it? What should we do? Shall we give up? No, we don't give up. We're Buddhists. We don't give up. We just keep going. And, um, and they have a little, little verse that they can chant and make it fun. And then the last few months, you know, children of, um, uh, <clears throat> I wanna go to the school and I meet children and, and, and the teacher says today, um, all the children want to tell you about the things that they, they did when they wanted to give up and they didn't. And a little, little uh, boy saying, I was trying to learning the alphabet and this letter was so difficult and I couldn't do it. And then I just thought, I'm not gonna give up. And I know I can write it. And, and so with these kind of very simple, um, you know, uh, kinds of um, encouragement and just to make that into um, a goal. And then when children see that parents think it's important, then that becomes part of their world. Oh, this is a world in which uh, not giving up easily um, is um, an important part of our, our life, our family life, our culture. Thank you, Ajahn. Uh, the next question is how to find balance between helping others and focusing on one's own development as our time in the world is limited. Yeah, there's no kind of textbook. Um, it depends a lot on your particular, um, your, um, your situation, your responsibilities to family. Um, obviously someone who's uh, caring for um, an elderly patient, a parent or grandparent or has um, young children. That's a time and uh, period in their life where um, there may be their time for themselves will be um, less than they would perhaps like it. So it's not, I, I, I think that um, balance is a kind of an aspiration, but it's not something that you can really expect um, to sustain um, very well, because there are always um, so many calls upon, upon you. And um, what I would say to repeat what I was saying earlier, though, that um, a daily meditation retreat, um, uh, meditation practice um, is one way of uh, refreshing and renewing yourself and um, helping you to return to your duties and responsibilities uh, to others um, with a sense of refreshed commitment. So I, you know, one, one of the things I like to talk about is this idea of being somebody and being nobody. And what I, what I think is a wonderful gift that we, and hope that we can receive from meditation is that 
once we our mind is on our meditation object <coughs> then uh, all of our our roles and our uh, all the people that we have to be in the world whether it's uh, sons daughters parents teachers students employers empl employees all those things disappear and yet we feel the most alive and clear and bright um, than at any other time. And so we begin to, this is the real balance, the balance between being somebody and being nobody, and just to enjoy that being, being absolutely nobody, just the, the body and the mind, the five khandhas, the, the breath going in and out of the body uh, in the present moment. And that's, um, that's the most refreshing thing. And because you have, when you have that experience uh, of nobody, then you, don't, then you don't take being somebody quite so seriously anymore. It's not that you, you, you give up, you don't want to do things for others anymore, but it's, you don't identify with that particular role or that particular um, commitment in the same way anymore. So I think that that's, in terms of, of, of balance, um, it's more that you're um, continually returning to balance. You lose your balance and you reestablish balance. You lose your balance and you reestablish balance. <clears throat> that it's not that, oh, now I'm balanced. And I just got to keep this going. Um, don't think it works like that. <coughs> Excuse me. So the the uh, the, the um, indications that um, you're out of balance um, first of all burnout um, often when people put too much effort into their external responsibilities at the expense of their own practice then um, maybe they're not always completely aware of it. But there's some resentment there. Um, so you might be looking after an elderly parent or someone, and you really um, do want to do it. You get a lot of joy about doing it. But if you're not looking after your own mind, within that, there is some resentment and that can fester. Um, the other thing is that in groups of people who are dedicated to helping others, um, where they're not meditating and really uh, looking within and taking care of their minds, there tend to be so many arguments and so many views and opinions and so much attachment to views and opinions. And I think many people, if it, uh, people who are uh, on the path of, of, of goodness and Dhamma, it's sometimes easier to let go of views and opinions about your own things that are restricted to your own life than it is for like what you believe is the common good. You know, so you have this sort of self-righteousness and uh, I'm right and this is uh, doing this for others. And, and so um, self-righteousness is a real um, fault and obstacle for good people in the world. And there is a reason why um, that learning how to return to being nobody at regular intervals can just undermine that and prevent that from becoming too strong. Thanks for that, Ajahn. The next question is that uh, I used to concentrate my mind by continuously keeping attention at the spot below the nose. This was my main practice for three to four years. In 2012, involuntary body movement started and gradually became stronger. With the slightest of concentration, my hands automatically slap my head. It is extremely fast that it cannot be controlled. As a result, I am not able to do sitting meditation as before. I'm not able to read any books due to tremendous pain in the head. I have constant fear of death. I consulted the best of doctors over the years but they are not sure what is happening with me. Could you please help me know how to manage this state? 
<clears throat> yeah, well, first of all, um, quite clearly um, establishing mindfulness um, in the head area is not a good idea. Um, and if you are going to continue with, with mindfulness of breathing, then um, should um, shift the, the point of uh, the focus of attention um, to the chest area or to the abdomen, or um, to um, be aware of the, the breath throughout the whole body from the top of the head down to the toes to start off with <coughs> um, initial kind of sweeping technique as is taught in the Goenka tradition, and then to uh, sustain the, the sensation of the breath um, throughout the body without uh, necessarily focusing on one particular point. Um, also, um, the, it's not necessary to close the eyes. You can keep the eyes um, slightly open and um, looking very soft gaze. Don't stare, but just looking down uh, on the floor in front of you. So you can experiment with um, various things. I, I would say if you, if you still you, know, you want to reestablish your, your sitting practice, then to start off with very short sittings, um, you can set the timer on your clock, on, on, your, on your telephone or whatever, just do sittings of five minutes um, and then gradually increase them um, and to see and to experiment in various ways, um, whether it's possible to, um, to uh, focus the attention on different parts of the body without these reactions. There's one or two um, points I would say that when these physical phenomena arise, um, it's almost inevitable that we, that we become um, primed for them. And the moment that there is um, even the slightest um, uh, appearance then of, of the phenomena, it's just starting to appear, then the mind sort of grasps onto it. Um, and in fact, um, it, it increases more than uh, it, it um, might necessarily have to. The other thing is that the um, number of these um, physical phenomena um, are, are uh, physical. Um, the modern medicine is good on looking at different parts of the body. It's not so good, I would say, it's the body as a whole. Um, whereas the um, herbal traditions or Chinese medicine or Ayurveda uh, might be, uh, might have some answers. Um, but also the practice of um, yoga or Tai Chi, these can um, work out if there are any blocks in the energy in the body. Sometimes there's uh, energy blocks and we can't, karmic blocks, which can be removed through um, certain kinds of exercise, particularly yoga and Tai Chi. Um, the, in the meantime, I would, I would suggest um, doing more walking meditation and uh, just um, sitting for shorter periods and uh, keeping the eyes open and moving and trying different kinds of meditation. Um, the, the loving kindness meditation is uh, a very good one to start with. And um, so I'd like to say something about loving kindness meditation here as well, that um, just using the, the phrase, may I be well, may I be happy, um, doesn't always work very well. I've, I've never found it particularly useful myself. The, uh, I think what is, it, what is useful is to, to ask yourself, what are the things that you most aspire to in your life? What are the spiritual qualities that you most aspire to in your life? So it might be to be wise, to be compassionate, to be kind, or so on. And then make those the object of your metta for yourself. So if you, um, may I be 
may I be wise, may I be compassionate, and then just imagine and just have a really feel how it would feel to be truly compassionate. And maybe you can recollect uh, compassionate teachers and or kind teachers that you, you have met or you, you listened to or, or watched. Um, um, and then as you, as you reflect, as you recollect, as you focus on those qualities which you most aspire to in your life, then, then, uh, then recognize the sense of well-being that arises together with that reflection. And that is the, 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 the metta for yourself um, that, can, that can arise. The other thing is to, to develop the metta for physical sensations throughout your body. So again, returning to that kind of sweeping technique and just to um, use the metta for the sensations on the top of your head and the sensations of the side of your head, just go through your body and just um, send thoughts of loving kindness. You, know, you don't have to say, may my forehead be happy, may my nose be happy, but um, it can make you smile also, it's kind of funny. Um, but you can, there's lots of things you can do in meditation. Is this, you don't have to just follow the books. You have the basic principles, um, then you can be a little bit creative and, and see what works for you. Some people say, oh, well, it says this in the books and I did this and it doesn't work, so give up. No, let's um, look what's the essential principle and how can we work around that and uh, find something that works for yourself. Thank you, John, for that. Uh, may I ask the next question? Uh -huh. John, the next question. Uh, I'm at crossroads between deciding if I should remain as a lay person and practice the eight precepts and dedicate the rest of my life to dharma practice and study uh, versus being a monastic. How should I proceed? As a lay person, I have the freedom of choice and time, but as a monastic, I'm afraid I will lose this freedom. In addition to then seeing the politics within monasteries, which then I may as well remain as a lay person. Kindly advise how I should think about the crossroads. <coughs> well, well, monastic life's not for everybody. I mean, I... <coughs> I'm a bit of a... Odd, odd man out. I mean, I took to it like a fish to water. I never wanted to do anything else um, since I was 20. But um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's tough. And yes, so the, the conventional kinds of freedoms are um, you, um, you renounce, um, but it, it's more you exchange certain kinds of freedom for others um, and the if you choose a monastery well and you and you make a, a reasonable commitment to it then there are all kinds of rewards uh, from day one um, for one thing just to be able to live in a community with a group of people that share your ideals and your values um, I think that's wonderful have people who are all on the same path of Dhamma. Um, and for me to live a life which is based upon very closely um, upon rules, regulations, conventions that were established by the Lord Buddha himself. I mean, even now, after all these years, that gives me goosebumps, you know, like all the, all the, um, the conventions that um, condition or affect my life, uh, you know, not uh, arbitrary. They were they came from the Buddha's mouth. You know, these are the uh, the the when the Buddha was um, before he died, as you know, before he entered parinibbana, he said after he left uh, the world, then let the Dhamma and the Vinaya be your teachers. Um, so as a monastic, you have both the Dhamma and the Vinaya as your teachers, and you're, um, you're living in a way that the Buddha himself um, designed 
to be most um, uh, conducive for development upon on the path of Dhamma. But as they say, um, um, it, it, it's not, it's a completely, uh, not completely, but uh, it's quite mysterious in, you know, the people who do stay and really take to monastic life and benefit from it. There are others who become monks and stagnate and don't really benefit from it as they should. Um, and there are others who are just um, actually progress better as lay people. It's to do with temperament, to do with barami, to do with old kama, uh, so many different different things. So my my advice is, if you if you feel uh, a monastic vocation, then uh, go and live in a monastery for a shorter period of time as a layman, as a lay practitioner, and get some kind of sense of what monastic life is about. Um, if you go, if you go on a um, like on a retreat for seven days or ten days, it's still like honeymoon period. You know, it's as you always have in the back of your mind that in a few days you'll be going back to the world. And um, but when you go for a longer period, and then you really you know start to be in the present moment in that environment, then you can have a, a better sense of whether this is a good move for you or not. So um, I, I would say that don't don't take this decision lightly and um, spend a number of periods of uh, retreat in a, in a monastery um, and really see whether it is um, what would be best for you in your practice. Jan, the next question is from someone who has taken a decision of that kind. So it's a monk and uh, his question is that sometimes people praise us uh, and it can be very difficult to not feel awkward. So what is the proper response in such conditions? To not to feel what, sorry. Awkward. To feel awkward. They feel awkward. They feel awed about the praise that they receive from people. So the oh, question. I always feel awkward. Ah, oh, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, well, that's just another feeling. I mean, uh, we're we're monks, and we're learning about how we feel. You feel self-conscious. Well, that's that's your object of meditation. Um, but you, uh, when people come to offer, make offerings to monks and to to bow to them, some people think, "Oh, these monks must get so conceited and must think they're very special." People always coming to bow to them and. But certainly for the Western monks, they, they feel more awkward and they feel unworthy and that um, they say, oh, I, I think they're probably better people than, than I am, you know, and they're coming and bowing to me. And, um, but they're not, they're, they're bowing to the, the sasana, they're bowing to the, the Dhamma Vinaya, and you're a representative of that. And, um, and I don't think that lay people are expecting uh, the people they bow to to uh, to be pure and and special in any way, but simply that they have made this commitment to uh, practice as a monastic, and simply that willingness to live within the vinaya uh, and to put forth effort on the path um, is considered in Buddhist communities to be uh, worthy of of respect and support. Um, so it's. I think the, the important thing to remember is that, that um, bowing doesn't mean that, you know, you're prostrating yourself and you're saying you're better than me. Um, it's, um, it's, we're just conforming to the uh, rituals of, of respect, which the, the Buddha laid down. These are beautiful ways of relating to each other. Um, and if both the, the person who is making the uh, gestures of respect and the person who's receiving them and both have correct understanding and are both keen on the path, then, um, then I think it's a beautiful, wonderful thing. I mean, I, I, myself, I, you know, I've traveled seven, eight hours in a, in a, in a bus or in a car and bowed to someone and then very shortly afterwards, come back again, you know, and, and I'd be happy with that. 
you know, that I, I sometimes I feel like I get more joy out of bowing to senior monks than to listening to them talk. Uh, uh, maybe people feel that about me as well. But it's just, it just feels such a, I, I, I love bowing myself. And um, I, one thing I regret as you become more senior is that people who you can bow to become fewer and fewer every year. Um, and the people who bow to you become more and more. So uh, I love it when I can find uh, a monk who is senior to me and I can bow to them. It's, it's just a, uh, I think it's uh, just a beautiful thing. But yeah, there will be self-conscious, but don't make it all about you. You know, it's like, um, oh, I'm not worthy of this. Or I feel, yeah, well, look at that feeling. What is that? Where does that come from? Thanks, Sajan. Uh, I'll ask the next question. Uh, this person says that he is very self-critical. Uh, he read uh, Ajahn Sumedho uh, on being non-judgmental and to not take life personally, but at a deep level, he feels that he's self-critical even in meditation. Kindly help. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's a sad case. <laughs> um, the, my observation, uh, I, I don't know if whether this would be helpful or not, is that um, if we observe, let's say a uh, self-critical person is going to do a good thing, do a kind thing, um, and let's say this kind action takes a few hours, and from the beginning, uh, the, mind, the mind of that person is really wholesome and doing this without any desire for any kind of reward or recognition uh, just it's a really good thing to do and 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 then within the course of that two or three hours for instance just for one second you know two seconds this thought pops into the mind you know that uh, uh, I bet uh, everybody's going to really praise me for this or something and it's just that that kind of um, thought and then the self-critical person just jumps onto that thought and says, yeah, that's where you're really doing it, isn't it? All that other stuff, you're just kidding yourself. And you're just trying to make it look a lot better. Really what you are. So, so basically you're, you're, you're starting off from this prejudice or this bias that negative thoughts are more real than positive thoughts. Unkind thoughts are more real than kind thoughts. So you can have like a whole hour of kind thoughts and then one unkind thought and you say, yeah, that's the real one, that's the real me. So it, uh, I would say it's based upon a, um, uh, a prejudice, or, um, a wrong view and a lack of observation of motivation and mental states that pass through the mind and, and giving too much importance um, to the negative and, and with the, so I'm suggesting, this is my hypothesis, that you think that you are basically um, underneath it all, a bad person, and all the good things are kind of superficial dressings that are not really who you are. But that's a, that's a self-view um, that you've created. And I, I would suggest that if you look very closely at how your mind works, it doesn't uh, map onto what's really going on as closely as you would think. Thanks, Ajahn, for that one. Uh, the next question is, Ajahn, that how long, long does it take to achieve Panya? I'm eager to let go of pain and past. <laughs> uh, no answer to that. It depends. Everyone's different. Isn't it? Um, a long time. Um, but you see, we're not starting off with a blank slate. You know, we've, we've all been... Uh, we don't know how much work we've done on this in past lives. It's not like we're all starting off from zero um, and we all, you know, there's a set curriculum um, and we've all got to follow this curriculum. But we've all, uh, many of us uh, in this position, you know, have been born in the human realm before. And many of us have been uh, exposed to uh, and learned and benefited from Buddhist teachings before. So, 
it's really hard hard to say it's, it, or if you um let, let let's compare it with following uh crossing a mountainous landscape you know if you climb up a mountain and then you come down into a valley and and it doesn't uh you know and then there's a mountain again and and um and it doesn't mean that you've been going up and up and that, that then you reach a plateau. Sometimes you do. So it's the topography of samsara. What I'm trying to say is that there's no clear, um, easily um, recognized, observed relationship between cause and effect over one lifetime. Um, you can see in certain areas, but it's not comprehensive because um, there are there's the effects and the the um, ramifications of things that that we've done in, in past lifetimes. So it's better not to have a, a kind of a time scale on it, but just to see what else do you want to do with your life, you know, other than develop wisdom. You know, so you know you've got to do it sometime. So why not why not do it now? And and enjoy the the path towards wisdom or the development of wisdom. So if you if you're looking at wisdom as something in the future and when will I have wisdom and how will I know if I have wisdom, um, that's just more more thinking. But uh, right now, you know how today how can you live more wisely? How can you reflect on your experience more 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 clearly, more incisively? I, I think that. Um, these time questions, one, that they're unanswerable, and two, they're not, they're not very good questions to ask, um, but it's really putting the effort into creating the conditions, and they will um, come to fruition in their own good time. John, the next question is that uh, this person recently started his career, and uh, he says that my livelihood is very well in terms of Samma Ajivo, but I'm not getting any satisfaction from my work. Should I consider changing my career or it is basically my mind creating drama? Well, I mean, there's, there's no, um, uh, well, there's no sort of liberation through, through livelihood, but the um, right livelihood, uh, one is, is um, is is cutting off and reducing um, the the bad karma, which performs an obstacle to progress on the path. Um, but there are also um, the uh, question of what what could you could you do to improve your experience of, uh, in your livelihood um, in terms of relationship with um, the other people that you work with and. Uh, um so i think there's always uh, if you're if you have like right livelihood if you you mean is you've gone beyond that uh, a livelihood in which you're is inherently destructive to um uh, the society you live in or the environment um is one which is not uh, doing any harm to anybody that's the sort of uh, basic uh, criteria for right livelihood but then say well um, how can I um, create some more wholesome dhammas here and uh, work in a way that I can feel some sense of pride? And uh, how can I, uh, it depends on, on, you know, your seniority and whether you're a boss or whether you're a, you're a worker and, and, and uh, how much power you have. But the more senior you are, the more power you have um, and the more you can find ways to make life yeah, enrich the life of your of your students uh, of your uh, of your uh, colleagues or your employees and so in in, in thailand many a uh, number of businesses for instance they uh, they send their people from their companies off on meditation retreats paid meditation retreats um, and try to increase the the morale and the a harmony of the group in a sense so you can get a lot of joy from that but the um yeah but i i would say generally that that it, 
don't expect too much from you know even just having a job in the first place and being able to make a living and to support yourself or your family members then there's something to be proud of um and having a right livelihood in which is uh, not only uh, not harmful to society but may contribute to the welfare of others there's something to bring up and it can be part of your meditation just a sense of oh you know i'm someone who uh, has right livelihood this is one of the eight factors of the eightfold path I do good in this way and that way. So bringing to mind the goodness that you um, that you create every day, making it uh, part of your daily reflections, um, can be using sama achiwa um, as a platform for kusala dhammas. Last two questions, Ajahn. Uh, one is that in Ratvanit Sutta. Uh, seven stages of purification have been mentioned. The request is to explain the purification by overcoming doubt. Yeah, I don't. Uh, the, 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 those seven stages of purification appear in, in one of the suttas in the Majjhima Nikaya and form the basis of the Vistuti Maga commentary. Um, it's not um, a, a structure that I've uh, necessarily followed in my my own practice, but I'll speak to you more about doubt and and uh, the role of doubt and dealing with doubt. Um, first of all, there are different kinds of of doubt, and if you remember in the in the Galama Sutta, um, where the Buddha visits the the villagers, um, who say we have so many religious teachers coming through. And every one of them says their teaching is correct and everyone else is wrong. And uh, they all speak so well and they're all so convincing. And you really feel this one's, this one's it. And then another one comes along and then uh, you're full of doubt again. Um, we're confused. And, and the Buddha says, that's good. You're, you're, you're doubting in things that should be doubted. So this is a case where the Buddha actually uh, praised people for doubting. When, when you're in a situation in which you, you realize you lack information that you need to make a good decision, then that doubt is actually wise. It's, a, it's an expression of wisdom. The, the doubt that um, is crippling is um, the a hesitation and the unwillingness to commit oneself in practice. Um, many people want to have cast iron guarantees beforehand that this is the very best, this is the right, this is correct, and I'm not going to do anything until I know beforehand. You can't know beforehand. That's the point. You you um, you study and you. Um, you come to some conclusion, but there comes a certain point where you have to say, yeah, enough information. Now you just have to make that leap of faith and um, review at regular intervals whether or not it's working or not. So that, that's, the, that's the kind of doubt, skeptical doubt, or the, the doubt that appears as a nivarana or a hindrance. Um, the the Wichi Kicha, which which um, is one of the Samyojanas or one of the fetters, which is abandoned by the stream entra. Um, here we have to see that in the uh, as it's related to the other two fetters, um, which is um, uh, an attachment to um, procedures and techniques and rites and rituals and specific ways of doing things and it has to be done like this and then so it's a it's a deluded view of causality basically um and the um the third and it's really the key um key uh, figure feature in these three um is sakaya ditti which is the view um, of the body and mind the five khandas as being self so, um, in vipassana practice, in the development of wisdom, 
and investigation of the three characteristics, um, then um, seeing all elements of the body and mind as um, conditions that arise and pass away according uh, uh, to uh, so according to conditions, then the the view and the attachment to the idea of an, an abiding, inherent, controlling self uh, is abandoned once and for all. And so um, simultaneously, the um, Sila Bhatta Paramasa, the, the wrong view of causality and the practices that lead to, um, to liberation disappears because now you know what is the correct path. And similarly, the doubt about the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, these also disappear through that direct knowledge and penetration of the true nature of the five khandhas of body and mind. So until there is a, a clear um, penetration and understanding of the nature of body and mind, the abandonment of Sakaya Ditti, there will also always be um, some doubt in the mind. But the, um, again, it's another mental state in which the important practice is to recognize, oh, this is doubt. The, the tricky thing about doubt is that when you're doubting something, you kind of feel smart. It feels like you're being intelligent, um, but you're not. And um, that's, that's the, you know, the particular uh, trap of, of doubt because it, it feels so much like investigation and being, um, and being cautious and being and thorough and circumspect, but uh, but it's it's not the case. Final question, Ajahn, that uh, what is the goal? What is the value of goal in Buddhist practice, or what should be the goal of a Buddhist practitioner? Um, the Buddha says that human beings are, um, are sublime beings, or they, they are, uh, we, we have the potential for excellence um, through training, that we become truly human, that our lives uh, attain true meaning through training, and that training of body, speech, and mind. So the, um, and, and what is the purpose of that training? Uh, the purpose of that training is the abandonment of all defilements, the development of all that is good and wholesome and uplifting and the purification of the mind. Now we can refer to that in a single word as Nibbana. Okay, so Nibbana is the, the highest goal. But how do, well, so what's Nibbana? Well, Nibbana, I can compare it a little bit to like physical health in the sense that if, um, if we try to explain physical health, we are, we're almost forced to use negative terms to say, well, uh, I'm in really good health. I don't have, um, I don't have, heart disease, I don't have liver disease, I don't have COVID, I don't have this, I don't have that. But it's very hard to explain physical health in positive terms. And so mostly the Buddha referred to Nibbana and the things that are not there. So talk about loba, dosa, and moha. So these are not three defilements, but these loba, dosa, and moha are like umbrella terms. That is to say they're groups. So there are many defilements in the Lopa group, in the Dosa group, and in the Moha group. Um, but the, um, the highest achievement uh, for a human being is, to, is liberation from all defilements and the uh, contingent suffering. Now, there is a way of, of talking about Nibbana in positive terms, and that is to, you, to look at the um, the qualities that uh, were most um, 
uh, salient and most impressive about, about the Lord Buddha. And the first is, uh, we call the uh, great wisdom, second great compassion and great purity. So in a positive sense, one who has realized Nibbana is one who has developed to the very highest levels, um, the wisdom and compassion and purity or inner, inner freedom. So the highest goal then we can, we can, on the negative formulation, is liberation from suffering and from all the defilements which are the cause of suffering. And on the positive formulation, it is the perfection of wisdom, compassion, and purity. Thank you, John. How wonderfully said. Very beautiful. And uh, although there are many more questions coming in, Ajahn, possibly that calls for another session at some other time convenient to you. <laughs> but, can I, have uh, a, I, I can go on a bit, bit longer if you like. Um, sure, okay. sure. Then we could take a few more uh, from what uh, we have received. Um, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes, the, one of the questions is, uh, could you please explain the concept of anatta? How can I develop myself when there is no self? Hmm. Um, there is a self, but it's not permanent, um, is one of the explanations given by uh, one of my teachers. Um, so we have to uh, recognize that firstly, um, the Buddha used the word atta or self in two different ways. Um, and the first way is in the conventional sense used generally. And this would appear in, in sayings of the Buddha, such as uh, we should be our own refuge, the self should be the refuge of the self and so on. So th this is ways in which the Buddha used conventional terms in conventional ways. But the um, the, the deep meaning of anatta, uh, we have to, first of all, establish the meaning of atta. So what is meant by atta? And, and the um, primary um, criteria or the um, nature of atta, I think, is, um, is um, power over or ownership. So if we say that um, we, we own something, it means that we have power over it. Um, so if there's a self and then there are things belonging to self, then um, simply the, the self should be able to exert um, control over all that belongs to self. So, um, and this is very simply, um, this sounds maybe sound too too uh, abstract, but Ajahn Chah's genius was to to speak in very concrete terms. He said, "Well, if this body was really yours, could you tell it? Don't get sick, don't get old, don't die. Uh, no, you can't. And so the body gets sick, gets old, and dies um, according to all the causes and conditions that that come to play. Um, it's not anything that can be." Um, determined, decided upon by an independent, self-existent entity uh, called self. So the lack of ownership and the lack of control um, is really how we um, how we look into anatta. And so we look at the constituents of body and mind, of, of the body, of feelings, of perceptions, of thoughts and memories and emotions and sense consciousness. Um, and we, the more, the more closely we look at them, the more we see the play of cause, causes and conditions arising and passing away. And that there's no controller, there's no owner of that. So anatta is not something that, that you can realize. It, it's the absence. But let's say that um, uh, there's, you believe that there's uh, radioactivity in a house. And so you go in with a Geiger counter 
and you go through all the ground floor and there's no sound on the Geiger counter. Okay, no radioactivity. You go upstairs and there's no click, click, there's nowhere. And so you can conclude um, from your investigation of every room in this house that there's no radioactivity, but it doesn't mean that now you have realized the truth of non-radioactivity. You see, it's not a thing. And, and anatta is not a thing that you realize. It's just pointing out your mistake and your assumptions um, that there is something there who is the thinker, the feeler, um, the one who uh, does, the one who is uh, who acts and is acted upon. And we also can observe to what extent our language um, encourages us to, to think that way. So we have a single word, I. And we say like, um, I'm, I'm hot or I'm happy or I, I remember or I think or I can see. So this um, naturally inclines us to think there is something called I who feels hot and happy and remembers and thinks and um, but that's just a convention of language. When we look directly at our experience, what we see is physical sensation of heat or a, a feeling, a sukhavetana arising and passing away, a memory arising and passing away, a thought arising and passing away without any need for an owner. So uh, one of the very, the very first Dhamma book I ever read expressed this idea so beautifully, I've never forgotten it, um, in which the author um, brought up the sentence, it is raining. And then he asked the question, what does the word it refer to? What is the it which is raining? Well, there, there isn't an it which is raining, there's just rain, isn't there? Um, and, but because our language uh, forces us to, to have a subject and an object and a verb, um, that we begin to think that's how nature truly is. Um, so we cut through conventions by practice of meditation and looking more closely at um, what's really going on in our body and mind. And we realize that that idea of a controlling self is, um, is nowhere to be, is, is a false one. I would say that one of the reasons that we, we believe in it so much is that we do have a, there is a certain kind of uh, window of opportunity. Um, the example I like to give is um, you can decide as an act of will, I'm going to hold my breath, okay? But um, after a certain amount of time, 30 seconds or a minute or ever, however long, uh, you can't hold your breath anymore, even though you really want to. But you do have that ability to express, to act, um, and to decide something um, in certain parameters, which nature gives you. So nature gives you, a, like, there's a little bit of wriggle room within the, the laws of nature. And that's what uh, encourages us to, to believe in this um, owner of, of experience and the, uh, this uh, permanent, independent, controlling agent. Thanks, Ajahn. Uh, another question, uh, Nampen Anoma wants to ask, could you please unmute yourself? Hi, Tanatan. It's number one. Oh. And I have a question. Uh, since I practice, so since I first practice, I feel that the center of the mindfulness is in the head. But now it's it's become in the heart, in the middle of the body, of mm -hmm. the chest. And I know that this is right, but it's very hard to make it stay. It's just like you're pushing the ball underneath the, the, the football, the ball underneath the water. Mm -hmm. 
And I try so many ways, like just to see whether I don't like when it comes up to the head again. I see that I don't like it, then it's go down. And um, sometimes I don't know what to do because it's it's very hard to stay in the, to make it stay in the chest. So um, I go into deeper peacefulness and that's help. And when I come up, when, but when I come out, it's easier to make it in at the chest. But I feel that when it stay in the chest, is it normal to have happiness? And yeah. the, and yeah. the joy and the rapture, is it normal? Yeah. Yeah, that and tends to happen when the uh, the um mindfulness is established in in the chest area that tends to um lead to feelings of bt and sukha um but you know, don't uh, don't try to to force it too much you know sometimes it's the wisdom of of the body and and uh, don't try to push down too much so sometimes they want to go up then just watch it there and don't don't fight with it because it then it becomes vipava tanha and um, then there's a new more subtle kind of of suffering but if if um, one alternative is to spread out the awareness throughout the whole body you know rather than having these two centers of the chest and the and the nostril just to feel it through throughout your body um, and like your body's like an oxygen bag, it's just expanding. But uh, you want to be at, at, at peace with it, however it is. You're not, because if you're still on, on the, trying to have it where you want it to be or to, to create feelings of pity and sukha and then make sure they don't fall away, then there's a lot, can be a lot of um, self um, arising there. It's too, it's too controlling. Um, so sometime, you know, the, this is the body telling you this is what it wants to do right now. Um, so be very, it's like training to teaching a child. Sometime you have to be a little bit strict, but mostly just to be gentle and, and just gently uh, incline it in the way that you, you want the mind to go. I have the, the mat dead, okay? I have the, the mat dead that I can train. Uh, tame it, like go into deeper um, peacefulness and come out. That's okay too. Yeah, that that that's fine. I mean that that's um, uh, important also. But uh, when you when you emerge from that deeper meditation, then um, the 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 work that um, remains is to be investigating the three characteristics. If you see people talk about being attached to samadhi, but if it's sama samadhi, you can't be attached to samadhi while you're in samadhi because uh, sama samadhi by its very nature is full of mindfulness and clear comprehension. But what can happen is when you withdraw from that samadhi, you want to go back into it. You just want to stay there. You don't want to go any further. You don't want to uh, investigate the three characteristics. Um, so this is the attachment. You want you just want to keep going back to the, to that um, calm place. But the the value of the access to that deep samadhi is that the mind is very strong when it comes out, and it is just almost like turbocharged, and the, it is a capacity to investigate the three characteristics is much enhanced and so that's what you should be doing there not worrying about where the the awareness is going here or going there this is the time to observe and to see the three characteristics the impermanence the dukkha and the anatta thank you so much i will contemplate on that thank you John, there are three, four more questions. Are we good to take some more? Okay. Yeah, I'm okay. Thank you. So
So the next one is how do we overcome tiredness after long hours of working? Uh, I'm a junior surgeon and need to, to do on calls and run the theater list. Sometimes I feel tired, which affects my judgment. Yeah, I think um, power naps are good. You know, if you have a very busy, busy schedule, just to close your eyes um, for 10 minutes is, uh, is very refreshing. You don't need to have a long time. It's, if you're young and reasonably healthy, um, it just allows you to um, make a fresh start. Um, if that's not practical, then um, a shower, uh, and a few minutes just with your breath, um, a few minutes meditation. I'm not sure, you know, what, what it, it must be very busy in the hospital, but um, I know some hospitals, they have a room where there are, there are beds and doctors can just nip in and have a, have a nap for half an hour in between um, uh, their, their commitments. And I think that's a really good thing. Um, it's it's a it's, from what I know it's a huge problem throughout the world, um, and the number of mistakes that are made and the number of um, yeah sometimes quite um, uh, serious uh, mistakes made by doctors simply because they don't have enough rest and they're working very long shifts, um, and if someone is very de well developed in meditation then I would say, well, yeah, you can just close your eyes for a couple of minutes and then you're, you're up and running again. But I, I doubt whether that's, that's the case. And um, I, I would say if you can just uh, slump in a chair or, <laughs> or uh, lay down, put, your, put your, you know, uh, an alarm on really 10 minutes, you can really benefit from, from 10 minutes um, with relaxation. Um, yeah, it's a tough life as a doctor, I think, especially now. The next question is, Ajahn, that imagination is an important ability of humans. It helps us in tracing uncharted territories, but at the same time leads to assumptions, fear of future, etc. How to make the ability to imagine productive and constructive? Yeah, well, just, I mean, imagination is is uh, imagination, and and um, what we want to to develop is uh, the ability to think well and to think um, in a at the right time and place. The thing about imagination, if you if you're um, if you have no training is that it just becomes the default mode, the sort of busy mode, always thinking and speculating. And, and so that's um, not so healthy. But through meditation, then um, you can develop the ability. Well, now this is a time where I don't need to think and can uh, enjoy not thinking. And now's the time to, to think. And as you become more disciplined and more developed in meditation than the unhelpful kinds of thinking, the thinking that just goes round and round in circles or makes you anxious or depressed, you can let go. So it's like, it's like you have a room just absolutely jam-packed with furniture. So you want to take out all the furniture that you don't use and just keep the furniture that you, that you do need, which is not very much at all. And I think with um, imagination, then often it's a matter of drawing lines between things that have generally been seen to be separate, making connections um, between, uh, between things. And the sharper your mind is and the less full of um, self-based thoughts and, and desires and fears and emotions, then I would think the more creative um, the mind can become. Uh, so uh, I don't think that meditation is, is necessarily a bar to creativity. Um, and in fact, it can be an aid to it. Um, but they have to develop those, those skills of uh, saying, well, now this is the time uh, that I need to put on my thinking cap. And this is the time where 
I just need to rest in, in awareness. Um, but the, uh, again, it's a recognition of imagination as imagination. And if you're using uh, imagination or creative process, then there's a very high failure rate. You know, you, you create maybe a, uh, out of a hundred things you create, only maybe one is going to be much good, and and that, that that's um, you know just just part of the creative process, isn't it? Last two questions: uh, Is it better to try to apply the right effort to get rid of unwholesome state of mind, or just see things as not self? Um, there's there's no conflict there. Um, so with, with with unwholesome dhammas, then there is a twofold effort. One is to look after your mind in such a way that the unwholesome dhammas don't arise in the first place. So that takes some some planning and a lot of mindfulness and effort. Um, and then uh, in on those cases where you're not successful. Um, in protecting the mind against the unwholesome dhamma, then uh, you need to find some skillful means of abandoning that unwholesome dhamma. Um, and in some cases, the reflection on anatta is one, is one tool in your toolbox that you can use, uh, but you don't want to, you'll be restricted just to one tool because different things work on different occasions and um, depends, um, you know, on so many different different factors. So, uh, you know, anatta is is a very powerful uh, reflection, and um, but it, unless you you know you're very um, well practiced and and been practicing for a long time, um, you need to have a, a number of different tools. If the mind is very um, just fallen into a lot of laziness and heedlessness um, and sort of lack of enthusiasm, um, then you know, we're taught to reflect on death and do the death meditation. If there's a lot of negativity in the mind that you can't let go of, then it's the kindness and compassion meditation. If there's a lot of um, sensuality in the mind and uh, getting caught up in, in the sensual world too much, then the asupa, reflecting on the unattractive elements of the body, um, are useful antidote. So the, the traditional uh, presentation is that you have a main meditation object, let's say uh, anapanasati, and then you have these three auxiliary methods of asupa and maranasati or death meditation and loving kindness meditation uh, to apply in like specific antidotes. Um, but the, the reflections on, on anatta uh, can be carried on throughout the day. Um, they're essentially reflections on, on causality and, and, and being really interested in the causes and conditions, how things appear, how things change, how things grow, how things um, weaken, how things disappear according to causes and conditions. So that, that reflection on causality is, is essentially the um, reflection on, on anatta. And the uh, anatta reflection is, is something which um, has a very important role to play, but uh, should not be relied on to the exclusion of other skillful means. And the final question, Ajahn, that uh, this person has come from uh, Burmese inside tradition and is now experiencing some doubt. He says that he or she, oh, sorry, I don't know. Uh, is it possible to elaborate on how breath meditation leads to insight? I'm worried my practice does not lead me to freedom and instead more attachment to peace. Yeah, you know, there there are, there are two things um, here. One is technique, and one is the, the relationship to your technique. Uh, so sometimes you know, there can be very very good techniques, but people have an unwise relationship to their technique, and then uh, when they're 
frustrations arise, then they blame the technique rather than uh, their attitude towards it. So this is something to bear in mind. The impatience and wanting quick results um, is a, a major obstacle. And whatever, whatever technique you use, you're going to have difficulties and it's going to take time. You know, the, um, you know, sometimes people talk about their practice really not going anywhere for a year or two years. Um, but this is, you know, practice probably take many lifetimes. You know, it's, it's not something that um, can be done according to, to our desires, and, but it's being on the path of practice. Um, so um, I, I've not, with regards to the, the Burmese um, insight techniques, is not something that I've, I've followed and, and practiced myself. So I'm not really qualified to, to make many comments on, on, on that technique or that way of practice. Um, but uh, I would um, really suggest that the, the questioner really looks, first of all, um, at what are their desires that are being frustrated? You know, if there's something, uh, what are the unwholesome dhammas that are increasing? And are they um, a, a function of the teaching itself or the a particular way that that person is is uh, relating to them and um, approaching them. Thank you very much, Ajahn. You've been extremely kind, compassionate, generous in responding to the questions for really long. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, can I can I say hello to one or two people? Where's Dr. Dar? Yes, yes, Ajahn. I'll just bring him up on the screen. Okay, Dan, how, how are you? How's your health? I'm okay, Ajahn. Namaskar. I'm okay. Yes. Yes. Carrying on with, up, with the roller coaster of the health, but no issue. Yeah. Nothing, nothing serious. Okay. You, but right now, you're healthy. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> and uh, Surinder, how are you? I'm I'm good, sir. Thank you. I'll write to you in a while. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your guidance and your support. It's really, really helped me quite a lot. Good. I'm glad. Um, and okay, I'll, I'll just say hello to everybody. Really, um, is Geraint still there? Geraint, has he has he disappeared? Geraint. Yes, here I am. Yeah, hello. How are you? See you again. <laughs> yeah. Keeping healthy. So nice to see you. Yes. Okay. Good. Well, I, I I can only see a small number of people, so if I haven't said anything. Uh, to you individually, then um, wishing you uh, all well, and uh, I'll just give the blessing to you. Very kind. Yatha Variwaha Pura Paripur and the Sagarang Eva Miwaito Hinang Petanang Upakapati Ichitang Batitang Tumhang Kipa Miwa Samitato Sapi Purentu Santapa Yanto Panaraso Yata Manito Tiraso Yata Sapi Tio Viva Chanto Sapharo Kovina Soto Mate Mawat Vanterayo Suki Tika Yuko Pawa Apiwa Tanasi Lesson It Yang Mutapatino Yataro Tama Watantia, you were no so kind. Hala Sad. 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 Sad.